بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. In today's lesson, we will continue from where we left off regarding the conquest of Mecca, and we had mentioned that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not inform anybody where he was heading until the very last minute, and uh, probably the day before or two days before, we don't know exactly when, he told them that, okay, we're heading to Mecca. Because you have to tell them eventually they have to leave the city, they have to prepare, they need to know they're going to face a battle, possibly. So he tells them that uh, they're heading towards Mecca. Now, what happens? One of the Sahaba, one of the Sahaba by the name of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, decides to warn the Quraysh that the Prophet is coming. And this story will take up the bulk, maybe even the entire of our seerah today, because it is a very, very significant story. A story that has a lot of benefits, and a story that is used today uh, in a uh, very political manner. A lot of controversy exists to this day about interpreting the story of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. So, who is Hatib and what happened? Hatib. Uh, according to the strongest opinion, was a mawla from Yemen. And a mawla is somebody that would have an immigrant status. A mawla is somebody that has an immigrant status. And he was a mawla to one of the Qurayshis. And what this means was he has a second class citizenship in Mecca. And he had converted to Islam and he had emigrated to Medina. But for reasons that are not mentioned in the seerah, his family, his children, and according to one report, even his mother remained in Mecca and they did not come with him to Medina. Now there is another opinion as well, and that is that Hatib was a slave who had won his freedom and purchased his freedom. And if we take this opinion, then we understand exactly why his children and his mother and whatnot had not left because they're all slaves. There's a second opinion that Hatib was a slave, but both opinions say that Hatib was not a pure Qurashi, that Hatib was uh, an Arab, and either he was a Mawla or he was a slave, and he had converted to Islam and left for Medina, and his family was still in Mecca. Now, Hatib wrote a letter directed to the people of Mecca. And the content of this letter is not mentioned in Ibn Ishaq, but it is mentioned in one or two other books. Of them, one of the reports mentions that he said to the Quraysh, he sent a letter that the Prophet and the Muslims are leaving with an army, and he might be heading towards Mecca, or he might be heading elsewhere, so take precautions. Then according to this report, Hatib would have sent the letter before the Prophet made the announcement, because he's not telling him exactly where. There's another report that he specifically said that the Prophet is heading towards you with an army like the night, kalayl. The meaning here poetically is it is dense and it is full of people because the, the, the night is like very dark and full and you can imagine the hordes of the army, this is compared to the darkness. And he is rushing towards you like a river, like a torrent. And I swear by Allah, even if he were to come to you alone, Allah would help him over you because Allah will fulfill his promise. Now, the second version basically shows that Hatib is telling them, look, doesn't matter what you do, he will win. But I'm just telling you this, that he is coming your way. And therefore, Hatib did not... He basically spilled the beans. He gave away the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, how did he manage to get this letter? Or what did he plan to do? He found uh, another Mawla lady uh, from the uh, Quraysh, from the Abdul Muttalib, the, from the Mawali of Abdul Muttalib's uh, Banu Hashim. So she, he found a lady who was going back to Medina and he paid her a Makkah and he paid her some money to smuggle this letter to the Quraysh. And he didn't tell her the contents, he didn't tell her the message, he simply paid her some money and he said, your job is to smuggle this letter to the Quraysh and make sure nobody knows of this letter. And so uh, she took this letter and folded it up and took, untied her hair and put it in the middle of her hair and then through the braids she tied the letter inside the braids of her hair. So the letter, the package was inside the braids of her hair. And she then began the trek back to Mecca. And notice here that Hatib, he chose a person that's not famous. We really don't even know her full name. 
and not somebody that's noble, so that attention would not be drawn to her. And he didn't even tell her the contents of the letter for secrecy. And the only thing she was told, you have to smuggle this letter and you will get the money if you smuggle this uh, letter. And she hides it in a place that she assumes nobody will ever discover and that is in between the braids of her hair. And there is no way that anybody would have found this out. Because who is going to know that Hatib wrote a letter? Even the lady does not know what is in the letter. And she's just getting some money to take the letter to Mecca. Nobody would ever have figured out had it not been for divine intervention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel down and Jibreel told the Prophet exactly what happened. That Hatib wrote a letter and this lady is taking the letter and you had better stop her. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Zubayr ibn al-Awwam and Ali ibn Abi Talib that go to a place called Rodat al-Khakh, which is right outside of Medina. Go to Rodat al-Khakh, you will find a lady on such and such a caravan, right? She has a letter, stop her and bring the letter back to me. So he told them where to find her. He described the uh, entourage and what she's going to be writing. And he said, bring that back to me. And look at how detailed knowledge he had uh, directly from Jibreel. They galloped to this caravan and at Rodat al khakh exactly, they found the caravan, they found the lady and they demanded that she hand over the letter. The lady claimed, I don't know what you're talking about. And so they searched through her entire belongings, every single item they went through it. They stopped the camel, they searched the camel, they searched the saddle, nothing was to be found. At this, when it is clear then that it's not in the belongings and you know she's not, she doesn't have a bag. She's wearing just the whatever the blouse or the skirt that the women would be wearing and she's not a Muslim. Uh, this lady was just one of the mawla of the Quraysh. She's not a Muslim. She's going for personal reasons back and forth between the cities. So Ali ibn Abi Talib said, I swear by Allah, neither has the Prophet been lied to nor have we been lied to. You will either give us the letter or we will strip you down and search you directly. Now notice here, neither has the Prophet been lied to nor have we been lied to. I.e. Jibreel didn't lie to him and he didn't lie to us. Look at his yaqeen. Look at his yaqeen. There is no way Jibreel lied to the Prophet and there's no way he lied to us. You must have the letter. So either you hand it over or لَنُجَرِّدَنَّكِ We will strip you. Literally, this is what it means. We will strip you and search you completely. And Ibn Ishaq says, when she saw their determination, and you can imagine they would have been fuming, and you can imagine their anger, when she saw that they are going to execute this threat, she told them turn around, so they realized that she's going to unclothe herself, so they turned around and she took off her headscarf, and she untied her hair, and then uh, gave them the uh, package, and they then brought her with the package back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And SubhanAllah, you have to remark here that okay, she's a non-Muslim lady, uh, but still she has that much haya that she is covering herself. And even in such a tense situation, she does not want them to see her hair. And by the way, covering the hair was something that all ladies did, Muslimah and uh, non-Muslimahs. They all did it at the time. This is something that was the custom and the culture of all civilized society, not just even in Arabia. It was done everywhere in Rome and here in America 200 years ago. This was the culture of the, of the people. And even in such a time, she tells them, turn around, i'rida. She turned around so that I have to take my headscarf off. And wallahi, it is sad that many of us, we don't have the haya even that this lady had, that at such a tense time, she still did not want the men to see her hair. And she asked them, turn around. She then hands them this and... Uh, they then take her as a prisoner with the letter to the Prophet She tells them exactly what happened, how to paid me some money and he told me to hide this letter and take it to the Quraysh. That's what I did. I don't know what's in the contents of the letter. And she's not mentioned after this and we can assume that she was let go because in the end of the day, she did not really know she's even doing any crime. She probably figured out this is some type of secret, but she had no idea that uh, this is going to be treason or treacherous. And she's simply doing the beck and call of, of uh, Hatib. So uh, she is let off because she's not aware of any crime that she has done. So the Prophet ﷺ called Hatib. 
and the lady is there and the letter is there and shows them the letter the plot has now been uncovered and Hatib confesses yes ya Rasulullah this is my letter he confesses this is my letter and Umar immediately said ya Rasulullah da'ni adribu unuqa hadha al-munafiq allow me to chop off the head of this munafiq faqad kafara billahi wa rasulih he has become kafir in Allah and his messenger Allow me to chop his head off because he has become a kafir. But the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Haltib, ma hamalaka ala ma sanat. Oh Haltib, why would you do something like this? Oh Haltib, why would you do something like this? And Haltib's response is recorded in many books of hadith. Actually, this story is mentioned in almost every book of hadith. Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi. It is mentioned in Muslim Imam Ahmad. It is mentioned in Ibn Ishaq Sirah. This is a, one of the most common stories of the conquest of Mecca. And it is mentioned in a lot of detail. And Haltib's uh, response has been pieced together from various narrations. That he said, O Messenger of Allah, why would I want to leave Iman in Allah and His Messenger? Why would I want to leave Iman in Allah and His Messenger? I did not do what I did, leaving my faith, nor did I prefer kufr over Islam. I did not do this for love of kufr. And I have not changed who I am or what I was. I'm still a Muslim basically. I haven't changed. I did not want to betray, meaning Islam, nor did I want to be a munafiq. It's not my goal to betray Islam or to be a munafiq. I knew that Allah would fulfill His promise and execute His command. Meaning, I knew you would conquer Mecca. I would no doubt that you would not be harmed. I had yaqeen that Allah would protect you. But what is His excuse? Rather, I wanted to establish a favor with the Quraysh so that my family and property would be protected. For all of your other companions have family that would protect their other relatives and I have no family in Mecca to protect my family. Now, what is he saying here? He is saying that the Ansar that are going to attack Mecca, they don't have any family. They don't have to worry about anything. The Muhajirun that are going to attack Mecca, every one of the Muhajirun belongs to one of the clans. Umar bin Khattab is the Bani Adi, Abu Bakr is this and Uthman is the Banu Umayyah. They're all the big clans. And no matter what relatives they have, they're not going to be harmed because they're the clans of Quraysh. Obviously, who's going to harm their own clans? But I have my family. According to one report, my mother is there. My sons are all there. And I don't have any tribe to protect them. What do you think is going to happen when they hear I am attacking? They will obviously harm or kill my family. And so I wanted to have some type of favor that they know that I have done some good so my family will be protected and look he has some perverted logic that I know Allah will protect you. Right? He has some iman in this regard that look you're not going to get harmed. I have full trust in Allah. Allah will protect you. I knew my letter would not harm you. I just wanted to get some fadl, some blessing uh, over the uh, Quraysh. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqa Hatib. Hatib has spoken the truth. La taqulu illa khaira. Nobody should say anything about Hatib anymore except good. Hatib has spoken the truth. This is his excuse and nobody should say anything bad about him. But Umar was still fuming. And Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, he has betrayed Allah and his messenger, so allow me to kill him. Now, the first time he said, this is a munafiq. And he has kafara billahi wa rasulih. He has rejected Allah and his messenger. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, he is speaking the truth, he has iman. Then Umar says, he has khiyana. Even if he has iman, he is a spy then. He has betrayed the trust placed upon him, so allow me to kill him. And this shows us that Umar is the first time he was asking for the execution, basically as if Hatib is a murtad. As if Hatib is a murtad. And we'll get back to this point later on. And the second time he's asking, he's asking as a punishment for the crime of spying. He's asking for the punishment for the crime of betraying the trust. So the first one would have been Ridda and the second one would have been Uquba, uh, would have been uh, a punishment for of the punishments of the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ said, did he not witness Badr? 
Did he not witness Badr? And how do you know, O Umar? Perhaps Allah has looked upon all of the people who were at Badr and said, اِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَقَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ Do as you please, for I have forgiven all of you. How do you know? This is what Allah has done. He has looked at the people of Badr and He has said, I have forgiven all of you. So Umar began to cry and he said, Allah wa Rasulullah wa Rasuluhu A'lam, Allah and His Messenger know best. And at this Allah revealed Surah Al-Mumtahina. Surah Al-Mumtahina. And Surah Al-Mumtahina uh, begins, Ya ayuha al-lathina amanu, la tattakhidu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya'a tulquna ilayhim bil mawadda. Oh you who believe, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies. لا تتخذوا عدوي وعدوكم أولياء تلقون إليهم بالمودة. You want to offer your friendship to them, and they have rejected. What is the ayah? تقول من ودتي وقد كفروا ما جاءكم من الرسول وقد كفروا ما جاءكم من الحق يخرجون الرسول إياكم. While they have rejected what truth has come to you, and they have expelled you and the Prophet, just because you have believed in Allah, your Lord. Then Allah says to سرون إليهم بالمودة. You secretly try to befriend them. وأنا أعلم بما أخفيتم وما أعلنتم. And I know. What you hide and what you reveal, and whoever does this amongst you, فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ Has strayed a very far away straying. He has strayed greatly from the path. So this ayah deals with Hatib. And Allah says to Hatib and through Hatib to anybody at a later generation, O you who believe, do not take as allies those who are your enemies and my enemies. لا تتخذ وعدوا عليكم أولياء Don't try to befriend my enemies and your enemies. They are your enemies. Anybody who's an enemy of Allah will be an enemy to the believers of Allah. And don't try to secretly befriend these enemies because they have hated you only because you have worshipped your Lord. And tu'minu billahi rabbakum. Just because you believe in your Lord. And if you secretly befriend them, Allah says, I know what you're doing. Hatib is being told, I know what you're doing. And whoever does so has strayed greatly from the uh, path. And Hatib does not really appear before this incident uh, too much, except that he participated in Badr. In fact, there's nothing mentioned about Hatta before this incident, other than that he is a uh, participant at Badr. He also participated uh, at the Bay'at al-Ridwan. And one more thing happened to him before he passed away, and that is that the Prophet ﷺ chose him to be an emissary to the king of Egypt, the Muqawqis, or the king of Alexandria. Uh, he sent him to Muqawqis. So Hatib became an emissary to the Prophet ﷺ in the next year, and then he died in the 30th year of the Hijrah in the Caliphate of Uthman. And just an uh, interesting tidbit here, one of his descendants, five, six generations down, one of his descendants, uh, 170 years after him, 180 years after him, became one of the main students of Imam Malik. And his name was uh, Ziyad al-Shabutun. And Ziyad al-Shabutun was one of the narrators of the Muwatta of Imam Malik. And he was one of those who took the Muwatta to North Africa. And he was one of those who spread the Maliki Madhab and the Muwatta of Imam Malik in North Africa. Uh, two or three of Imam Malik's main students, including Yahya ibn Yahya, they were the ones who studied with Imam Malik in Medina. And this was the time when Andalus was being opened up and conquests were taking place. So a lot of those students, or two or three of the main ones, they migrated from Medina to Andalus. And it was for that reason that Andalusia became Maliki in Madhab. And to this day, the Maliki Madhab is the most predominant in North Africa, as all of our North African brothers uh, know. So one of the people who spread the Maliki Madhab uh, in that region and in Andalusia was one of the descendants of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, subhanAllah, such as the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this story has so many benefits. This is the story of Hatib. We want to pause for a while and discuss some of the benefits of the story of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. Of the benefits of this story is the infinite knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing escapes Allah. And this reminds us of the hadith of Bukhari that the lady who complained about her husband came to the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And Aisha says, Wallahi, I was trying my best to hear what is she saying from behind the curtain. And I heard a phrase and I couldn't hear a phrase. And Allah heard it from above the seven heavens. لَقَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهُ 
Wallahu, uh, and uh, Allah Azza wa says, Allah hears the one who com comes to you arguing about her husband and complaining to Allah. So Aisha says, I couldn't hear, I was in the same room. She was literally in the same room behind the curtain. I couldn't hear. And Allah heard from above the seven heavens. Here we have another story of uh, Hatib ibn, ibn Abi Balta'a that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal exposed the plot and nobody would ever have found out. Also we see over here that dua is the weapon of the believer. Our Prophet made a dua, we mentioned it last Wednesday. He made the dua that, Oh Allah, do not allow my plans to become known to them. This dua was answered. This dua was answered. This was the real precaution. He made a dua to Allah, Oh Allah, do not expose my plan to them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that dua and the plan was not exposed. Also, of the benefits of the story, look at how Allah worked what He wanted to do. If Allah had wanted to, a lightning bolt would have come out and struck the woman. If Allah had wanted to, the earth would have opened up and the woman would have fallen down. If Allah had wanted to, the camel would have lost in the desert and she would have died of thirst. Correct? But... Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to do as much as you can and He will do the rest. Allah wants to see from us our efforts and then He will take care of the rest. So even when Allah is intervening directly, He still wants us to do the rest of that. You see the point here? That the Prophet ﷺ had to go send people, stop the girl, search her, then bring her back. And subhanAllah, this is the sunnah of Allah. Even when Allah is going to help, you still have to stand up and run. You still have to physically exert yourself. Allah is not going to help you by you, when you're sitting on your behind not doing anything. You want Allah's help, you have to give 100%. Then you put the rest in Allah. And this is what we see clearly from the miracle of uh, revealing Hatib's plot, that even the miracle was just enough that, okay, khalas here, now you do the rest. And why is this? Because Allah Azza wa Jalla wants to see who does versus those who do not do. And another benefit over here is that uh, the penalty for treachery and for treason is death. The penalty for treachery and treason is death. And that is clearly shown in Umar, the second question. That he's saying, Ya Rasulullah, he has betrayed us. Let me execute him. And this is the general rule across all countries and nations. This is the agreed upon rule that still is applied to this day across the globe. Even in this land, in America, as recently as 50 years ago, the Rosenbergs were executed, um, husband and wife, couple, were executed for selling pieces of paper to the Soviet Union. They were given the death penalty for selling pieces of paper. That's it. They sold pieces of paper and this was deemed to be worthy of the death penalty. And the judge famously remarked that you have done something worse than murder. I would have given you a lighter penalty if you had murdered uh, somebody. So nobody can come and say Islamic laws are barbaric. The reality is treachery and deceit is not considered to be uh, an excusable offense, really in hardly any nation state, including this country of ours. Now there's a lot of controversy in fiqh books. Can the treacherous person be forgiven or not? There's a lot of controversy. If somebody is treacherous to the Muslim state and he sells the secrets, and this is obviously we're talking about a hypothetical Muslim state, if there's a Muslim who is living in such a, a state and he betrays the trust of the state, and he sells the secrets, or he tells about the plans. Can he be forgiven or not? And many scholars say he cannot be forgiven. And Ibn al-Qayyim argues that it is up to the ruler. If the ruler wants to forgive like the Prophet ﷺ, he can forgive. Uh, but other scholars argue the Prophet ﷺ only forgave because of the Battle of Badr. And the Battle of Badr is something specific to 313 people. And therefore, anybody else will never be excused for that crime because the crime of Hatib was only forgiven in light of the battle of Badr. And who can then compete with the battle of Badr? So the majority opinion is that, not the majority, is to say a large group says that there is no repentance for the spy. And a minority or a slightly lesser than 50% maybe argues that no, it is up to the Khalifa and Ibn al-Qayyim is of this opinion as well. We also benefit from this 
the humanity of even the Sahaba. Even the Sahaba are humans. And a Badri, a person who participated in the greatest battle in Islam, can fall into such a major error. And this gives us hope, because all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. And who amongst us can claim to be sinless? If even the Sahaba fell into mistakes and errors, and yet Allah forgave them when they repented, then how about us as well? And uh, in fact, Allah Azza wa Jal describes this act, فَقَدَ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ He has gone far away, but Allah did not call him a kafir. Allah did not strip away iman. Allah said he has gone far away. And therefore, this was a major sin, but Hatib did not uh, become a non-Muslim because of it. We also see over here the forgiving nature of the Prophet ﷺ. He is defending the life of Hatib, uh, and he does not allow Umar to execute Hatib. And of course, we see as well the nature of Umar. And of course, Umar, we understand his sternness, but we need to understand that sternness was coming out of a love of Islam. That strictness was coming to protect Islam. Umar wanted to make sure that nobody would do this again. And his strictness was a mercy to the Ummah when the Ummah needed it. Right? We needed Umar at times. And at times the strictness of Umar will not work with, with the people below him. Sometimes you need soft, sometimes you need strict. And Allah gave the Ummah Umar ibn al-Khattab when they needed Umar ibn al-Khattab. And if you notice, it was in the time of Umar that most of the conquest took place. Right? That was the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And we also benefit from this, that we judge people based upon the sum total of who they are and what are they doing. We judge people based upon their good and their bad, and not just their bad. And this is a very important point, that we look at what people are doing, we look at overall, are they doing a positive impact or a negative impact? And the righteous person who commits one error or a mistake is not the same as the sinner who is a habitual sinner and commits the same mistake. This is like the story of the boy who cried wolf, right? Somebody who never cries wolf and he cries wolf once, you accept him, you trust him. But the one who is always crying wolf, what's going to happen? He will not be treated like the one who never cries. And in fact, there's a hadith that supports this. In Sunan Abi Dawood, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, أَقِيلُوا ذَوِ الْهَيْآتِ عَثَرَاتِهِمْ أَقِيلُوا ذَوِ الْهَيْآتِ عَثَرَاتِهِمْ Which is a very beautiful hadith, which translates as, the uh, people of nobility, when they fall into a mistake, then cut them some slack. I'm translating, you know, not literally, but you get the point here, right? The people of nobility, the will hayats, the people of sha'an, the people of stature, stature in your community, when they commit some type of error, when they slip, then cut them some slack. This is a hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood. And this shows us that when a person of stature, of nobility, not necessarily a person of religiosity only, but there are people that are movers and shakers of the community. There are people that are the financiers of the masajid and the community centers. They might not be the people of knowledge, but they are the will hayat. They are the people of stature in the community, right? Though people who have done something positive value for the community, they do something wrong. The Prophet said basically aqilu, which is overlook it. Yani cut them some slack. And this shows us exactly what we see over here and that is we look at the overall positive and negative. And we do not judge somebody looking only at the negative. And this is one of the most common problems in our times. And that is that we are blind to the good that somebody is doing. And if a person falls into an error, khalas, the whole world stands up and doesn't sit down. The whole world becomes a, uh, a critic. And this is especially true. And I have to say this, uh, even though I'm a part of those who are being attacked in this regard. But inshallah, it's not for me. Uh, I'm not doing this for my ego or suffer or whatnot. But the scholars and the students of knowledge and the du'at of the world. It's not possible except that they will make some mistakes. After all, they're talking every day of their lives, almost, right? The mashayikh and the ulama, what do they do except talk, 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 right? And these days, their talks are permanently recorded, correct? 
These days everything they do gets onto YouTube, gets onto this and that. And it is impossible that somebody who has a thousand hours or five hundred hours or a hundred hours, that you're not going to find something that is clearly a major mistake and some minor mistakes and some slips of the tongue, correct? Right? And some of these mistakes will be genuine mistakes. Meaning he messed up. After all, he's human. So for somebody to now go and collect those errors and say, oh look, he messed up here, he messed up there. Wallahi, this shows honestly a disease of the heart. You do not see the overall. Here is a shaykh that has a thousand lectures. And you go and find 20 minutes, 5 minutes, 3 minutes. Even if he's wrong in those 3 minutes, look at the good that he's done. And see the positive and the negative. And wallahi, this is something that clearly in our times we have this issue and problem. Uh, but for those of us that inshallah want to follow the sunnah, we are told, look at the good. And Hatib is judged in light of who he is. In light of the fact that he is a, uh, a Badri. Also, another benefit that we get from the story of Hatib is we confirm reports. It is amazing that the woman has the letter and the evidence is quite literally in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, and yet he still calls Hatib and says, did you do this? Think about that. Think about that. Everything. I mean, even forget the lady and forget uh, the, the letter Jibreel has told him. Hatib has done this. Do you need any more evidence? Right? Jibreel has told him. Hatib has written the letter and the, given it to such and such a lady. Go stop the lady. You don't need any more evidence. Yet he still calls Hatib and he confirms. Do you think the Prophet ﷺ doubted that Hatib did it? Of course not. Jibreel has told him everything. I mean, that's it. You know. But why is he doing this? For us. To verify to us when we hear such things. Even if the evidence is in your hand, confirm 100%. Then look, after Hatib confirms, literally the evidence is in his hand. The handwriting of Hatib, right? Everything. The lady says, Hatib sent me. The money, everything. Still, he then exp asks Hatib for explanation which shows us what it shows us what give a chance what is the other party going to say hear their point of view even if Hatib did it what is his reasoning for having done it what is his circumstance perhaps there is a reason we don't understand and this also shows us therefore that just because you confirm a person did something without hearing his side of the story, don't pronounce the final verdict. Verify what was the cause, what was the reason for this. And this shows us one of the major differences in uh, Islamic law and most of Western law, especially uh, American law and even British law. Uh, Western law, this is a side tangent here, but by and large Western law is codified. It's canonized. Which means that the judge will open up the book and say, okay, you are guilty of this and this crime, and the law has mandated that you will get between 100,000 and 150,000 fine, and between 5 years and, ten, and 7 years, let's say, right? You get my point here. It is mandated. And the judge has no power if the jury has said you are guilty. The judge has no power to get rid of those punishments. You understand? He only has very minor fine-tuning between 100, 150, let's say, right? Between five years to seven years. Fine-tuning. But it is canonized. Everything is set in stone. You cannot go out of it. And if it goes out, you're inventing a new law, basically. Otherwise, if there's a precedent established, every pre-law school and every lawyer knows this, once the precedent is established, 99% of judges will follow that precedent. And they'll stick by it. Once it's done, it's done. Now, in the Islamic system, which is very different, the Qadi, not Yasir Qadi, the Qadi, the Qadi will look at the human factor. Islamic law through most of its time was not canonized. And this is a wisdom of the Sharia. Ah. Islamic law was not canonized. Why? Because people have different reasons for doing crimes. And sometimes the extenuating circumstances really and truly absolve the liability upon this person. 
And there are so many cases, and there's actually a strong movement here in America as well, to, I mean, the classic case is the three strikes and you're outlaw in, in uh, California, right? One of the most barbaric laws in this country. Three strikes and you're out. Three offenses of any type and you will be given life in jail. And sometimes these offenses are quite literally, you stole a bike and you punched somebody and you did this and that, three minor things and the person is now going to jail for life. Because they have established this law since whatever, in the 80s or 90s, I forgot when. And khalas, that's it, three strikes and you're out. And there are hundreds if not thousands of cases where the judge himself has said, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you. But, you know, I can't control the law. The law says this and that's it. And that's why Islamic law generally did not canonize. Now, it did canonize in the last period of the Ottoman Empire. And then it, uh, that was a failure. They did the Qanun. Uh, they did the Tanzimat reforms, it is called. The Tanzimat reforms, they tried to canonize Islamic law. But it didn't quite work that way. The British also tried to do it, by the way, in India in the 1800s. Uh, but that too did not work. It wasn't successful. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, back to the story of Hatib, that there are extenuating circumstances. And the judge sees the humanity of the person, maybe there's a reason and whatnot, and has the discretion what to do in this regard. Another benefit that we gain from the story of Hatib is that when the Prophet ﷺ asks him, why did you do this? And Umar is there with the sword to execute him. Hatib does not plead for his life. Hatib does not say, spare me. Hatib does not say, uh, you know, don't kill me. Hatib is arguing to defend his iman not to defend his life. And subhanAllah, this really shows us he was a man of Iman. He was more concerned about his Iman than he was about his life. When Umar is saying, let me kill this kafir, what irritated him was not the kill part, it was the kafir part, the munafiq part. And his whole paragraph that I recited to you was what? Ya Rasulullah, I'm still the same person. Ya Rasulullah, I don't have any desire to become a kafir. Ya Rasulullah, I knew Allah would protect you. Not once does he say, spare me. In fact, most likely, Hatib thought he would be executed and he's resigned to that fate. What he's worried about is to be labeled a kafir. And he's pleading to be labeled a Muslim. And wallahi, that shows his iman. The concern is not the knife or the sword. The concern is, Ya Rasulullah, I'm still the same person. I have no desire to embrace kufr after Allah has guided me to Islam. I have no raghba for kufr. He says this. I have always been a Muslim. And so this shows us the iman of uh, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. He's going to die from his opinion. And he wants to die in Islam. Uh, also we see over here the softness of Umar as well. That instantaneously, from the anger of wanting to kill Hatib, when the Prophet ﷺ says to him, that, what do you know? What do you know, O Umar? وَمَا يدريك means quite literally, how do you know anything? What do you know, O Umar? Allah looked at the people of Badr and said, do whatever you want, I have forgiven you. And that one phrase causes the anger in Umar to completely dissolve, and he begins crying from that anger. We view Umar as being a very harsh and strict man. The fact of the matter is, he had a very tender heart as well. Under that harshness was a very soft heart. And Umar began crying, and uh, he is crying. Uh, it does not mention why he is crying, but perhaps he is crying because he himself is a Badri, and the blessing that he has just heard is overwhelming. Or he is, might also be uh, crying because he is... Uh, saddened at his, or he is like repenting from his own quickness to kill Hatib, and he just hears that Allah has forgiven Hatib, and he wants to kill Hatib. So we don't know the exact reason, but it became so emotional, this one phrase, that Umar begins to cry when he hears what the Prophet ﷺ has to say. Another benefit from the story of Hatib is that when the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقولوا إلا خيرا, Nobody should criticize Hatib after today. Then Hatib lives for another 22 years and never once does anybody utter against him, oh, this is the traitor. Oh, this is the one who did such and such. No. Once the Prophet has says, do not say good about him. Sorry, do not say anything but good about him. 
Once he has said this, خلاص, Can you imagine what type of leader must the Prophet have been to have so much respect that for 22 years, as long as Hatib lives, forget 22 years, up until now, nobody criticizes Hatib. We excuse him, we sympathize with him. Why? Because our Prophet ﷺ said, nobody should say anything bad about Hatim. Subhanallah. What amazing respect that Rasulullah ﷺ has amongst the Muslim Ummah. That once he has said this, Hatib's huge crime actually becomes something that we overlook and we say nothing but good about Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. Also, uh, we have uh, one final point, which is really a, a long one. I'm going to try to finish this in at least uh, 10 minutes and then move on to one more incident. The story of Hatib has taken on a huge controversy, especially in modern times. And the controversy deals with the status... Now, you have to pay attention to this. It's a, it's a theological controversy. And it, it, and it deals with modern politics and political issues, and also it deals with the jihadist movements as well. And that's why it's very controversial. The issue is, the status of the Muslim who helps an enemy against other Muslims. Clear? The status of a Muslim who helps an enemy who is invading the Muslims, helps the enemy in that invasion. Because that's what Hatib is doing. Hatib is giving away the secrets. Right? Hatib is basically giving away the secrets and helping the enemy against uh, Islam. Now, Hatib himself, nobody ever considers him to be a non-Muslim because the Prophet ﷺ testified. So, Hatib is Sahabi radiallahu anhu. The Prophet ﷺ forgave him. The question is somebody else who does it, not Hatib. Hatib is Sahabi radiallahu anhu. The question is, what about somebody in our times? If he were to help an invading force, and this invading force is invading a Muslim land, and this Muslim helps him, maybe even is a part of that army. You understand, we're getting more and more political over here, right? Maybe sells them things, maybe works for them, or their defense forces. Or maybe he does this and that, or he's a computer programmer working for that. You know, the whole issue here comes in. And there is a whole spectrum of opinion, but there's two primary opinions here. The first opinion is the more stricter one, and that is anybody who helps an invading force against a Muslim nation and land, that person has become a kafir by that action. And their primary evidence is Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 51. Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 51, وَمَن يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whoever allies with them shall be one of them. وَمَن يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whoever becomes an ally to an invading force, to enemy of Allah and His Messenger, will become one of them. So, this group says, therefore, anybody who helps an invading force and betrays the Muslims, that action of his is an action of kufr in and of itself. Equivalent to worshipping an idol. Equivalent to disrespecting a mushaf. Equivalent to astaghfirullah, cursing Allah and His Messenger. Clear? Right? And this is the position of... Uh, Many of the uh, medieval scholars, and in particular, it is the position of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, and uh, the later scholars of the Najdi Da'wah. This is a very common position of theirs, so much so that in his famous book, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he wrote many books, and of those books is An Nawaqad al Ashara, or the 10 things that negate one's Islam. And the eighth number on this list of 10 is to aid the kuffar against the Muslims. To aid an enemy force, basically against the Muslim, this is a naqid min nawaqid al-iman. Which basically means it destroys iman. And 
This was also the opinion of the Egyptian uh, Sheikh Ahmed Shakir, rahimahullah ta'ala, the famous muhaddith who passed away uh, 1927 or something, 1930, basically in the early part of the last century. Ahmed Shakir, Sheikh Ahmed Shakir uh, was uh, obviously alive during the time of the British occupation of Egypt. Uh, many people don't know this, and it's a, uh, some of the th these facts need to be said very clearly, that Egypt was invaded by England, and England ruled Egypt directly and indirectly for almost a century. First Napoleon invaded in 1792, then Napoleon fled back and left, literally overnight he became scary, he basically he just abandoned it, and then the Brits invaded, the Brits overtook uh, the, uh, the country and then they ruled it, and uh, eventually uh, King Farouk was overthrown because King Farouk was seen to be a vassal of the British. We talked a little bit about this in the 1914 lecture. The point being that Ahmad Shakir was alive at that time. And Ahmad Shakir uh, wrote a fatwa that anybody who helped the British in any fashion or form, even by speech, that he approved of the British rule, or he did anything, such a person was a kafir murtad. And either he is very ignorant, and Allah might excuse him, or he will accept Islam again and repent, otherwise this person is a murtad who has left the fold of Islam. And that's a very harsh uh, position, and it is a position that is held by many scholars in the past and in the present. Some amongst them, this group, some amongst this group, and this is very popular in uh, later Najdi circles, they separate between two concepts uh, of tawalli and muwala. And they say tawalli and muwala are two separate things. This is very advanced stuff, I don't want to confuse you too much, but they say there are levels of cooperation. Let me put it this way. There's a higher level and they call it tawalli. And that is kufr. And there's a lower level called muwala and that is not kufr. And they give examples that tawalli would be to fight in the army or to be a spy. Muwala is to sell fruits and vegetables to the army, let's say. Right? They're coming through your town and you sell them fruits and vegetables. That's not going to make you a kafir, that's a major sin. That's muwala. Okay? So they distinguish between tawalli and muwala. Now this is an opinion and uh, this group would say that Hatib was forgiven specifically because of his status at Badr. You understand this point? Hatib is a specific case. You cannot make qiyas on anybody. Khalas. Nobody else will be forgiven like Hatib. And uh, this is the position of, as I said, many scholars, including yeah, any very respectable and famous scholars. Uh, my own teacher, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymi, Sheikh Ibn Baz, the previous Grand Mufti. This is the standard position of the later Najdi Da'wah, and that is that any type of support to any uh, army or whatnot is kufr akbar. It is kufr. It's not a sin. It is kufr, and you are not a Muslim anymore. Um, there are other opinions as well. It's not the only opinion in the book. And Shaykh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah Taala had another opinion, and his opinion was that if a person aids such an army for a personal reason and not a religious reason, it is possible that that is a sin and not kufr. Now, we all agree, both sides of this group, that anybody who aids the enemy of Allah out of a love for the enemy because he's the enemy, and out of a hatred of the Muslims because they're Muslim, well then, this is kufr simply by these emotions in the heart. Even if he sat at his house and didn't do anything, we would say if you want the enemies to win over the believers, simply because these are enemies and these are believers, then this is kufr akbar. Is that clear? Right? If, per, if a person has this type of notion, then this is kufr anyway. But what if somebody is helping for a personal reason? And Ibn Taymiyyah says, and for those of you who are advanced students of knowledge and you are interested in this stuff, Majmu' al-Fatawa, volume 7, page 523, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says, it is possible that a person loves these enemies for family reasons or for another maslaha, another worldly benefit. And this would be a sin that diminishes his iman and would not make him a kafir. 
as what happened to Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a when he warned the Quraysh about the invasion of the Prophet ﷺ and for which Allah revealed Surah Al-Mumtahina. So how does Ibn Taymiyyah interpret the story of Hatib? That Hatib committed a sin and not kufr. Why? Because he didn't want to help the Quraysh because he loved the Quraysh because the Quraysh were idol worshippers. Had he wanted to help the Quraysh because the Quraysh were idol worshippers, then this is kufr. Khalas. End of story. But he wanted to help them out of a love for his mother, out of a love for his children. And so he preferred the love of his children over the privacy of Allah and his messenger in this regard, i.e. the secret. And this is a major sin. But he did not do an act of kufr. He did not, and this is the whole paragraph of Hadib if you look at it. What is he saying? That, Ya Rasulullah, I have no desire to commit kufr. Ya Rasulullah, I'm still who I am. Ya Rasulullah, I'm still a believer. His heart is still full of iman. And therefore, uh, this is a very controversial. You know, why is this controversial in our times? Because the fact of the matter is that a lot of the fitna and fasad happening in our times in Syria, especially in Iraq, in many other lands, what happened as well in Afghanistan in the 80s was that this rule, well firstly, as a general rule, almost all of the quote-unquote jihadist groups, and when I say jihadist, by the way, it's not a derogatory term. I, this is just an academic term that is used to describe them. They are groups that are involved in this understanding of jihad. I don't view killing innocent people as jihad. This is not jihad. But these people have their versions and understandings, and they're called the jihadist groups, right? We all believe as Muslims in legitimate jihad, which is a jihad for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. We don't believe in the jihad that these groups do, which is innocent killing and bombings and whatnot. These jihadist groups, as a general rule, all of them follow the stricter positions about takfir. They love the issue of takfir. Takfir means what? Calling a Muslim a kafir. As a general rule of thumb, the jihadist groups are also takfiri groups that they're very quick in making takfir. Anybody who doesn't agree with their version of Islam, he's not just a bad Muslim, he's a kafir. Not just a kafir, a munafiq, not just a munafiq, a murtad, not just a murtad. He is the, uh, yani he's helping the, 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 Muslim, the kafir against the Muslim. Now, regardless of what the theoretical understanding of Hatib's story is, the problem comes when you take this theoretical understanding even if you follow the position of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, let's say, right? And I don't have a problem theoretically with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's position. The problem comes when you cut and paste it from the book and you apply it to your group. So your group becomes Islam. And another group that is praying, practicing, following the Sharia, five times salah, avoiding the major sins, because they don't agree with you, they become kafir. Right? And they might help another group against you. And this is what's happening in Syria, by the way, right? In Syria, we have the fanatical jihadist groups and we have the moderate groups. They're both combined in fighting against the Taghut, the Fir'aun of our times. They're both combined against fighting against him, correct? Now what happens? One group might, not might, one group does go to excessive violence. Shooting and killing and, and killing innocent people. So another group, which is also fighting Bashar al-Assad, will come and say, guys, stop. If you don't stop, we're going to have you, force you to stop. And they might bring in another force and army and stop the more fanatic group. You're following so far, right? I, I, I obviously don't want to mention names at this stage, but you understand theoretically what I'm saying. Then what's going to happen? The more hardcore, the more fanatic group is going to invoke this principle. And they will say, you have aided a Muslim group by appealing to the UN, let's say. Okay? So you are kafir, murtad, bal, mudil, munafiq. So you are halal to kill. And then they start killing one another, which is exactly what's happening. And you know, if you're following the news, you know exactly which groups I'm talking about here. Right? There are moderate groups that want to fight the taghut and they're not killing innocent people. And then you have the fanatic takfiri groups that are also fighting the taghut, but now they're fighting other Sunni groups as well. And they're using the story of Hatib 
as one of the main evidences and the whole issue of Nawaqid al-Islam and the eighth principle of uh, you know the Nawaqid al-Ashara and they're simply cutting and pasting and they're saying this is Naqid bin Nawaqid al-Islam and this type of fanaticism and this type of basically extremist ideology is more dangerous for the Ummah more dangerous for the Ummah than the invasion of the non-Muslims to Muslim lands and this is really one of the biggest battles that we are waging from within now. That when we, and I am one of them, who criticizes these extremists, immediately the reaction comes that, oh, you must be supporting the kafir, so you are kafir. Right? And of course, I have been made takfir of at least a hundred times by now from these groups, even though I have said a million times that we all agree that uh, the foreign policy of this land is the greatest source of the anger and the terrorism. We all agree. I have said this multiple times, that the reason why people are so angry is because of what this land has done in those countries. There is no justification. But their anger must be expressed in a legitimate manner. And if they were to express it in a legitimate manner, we will support. But if you're going to kill innocent people, you're going to bomb indiscriminately, no, this is not jihad that Allah and His Messenger have laid out. So when we try to correct this, and others try to correct it, khalas, immediately we become helping the kafir. Why? Because we're somehow criticizing them. So they begin to represent the religion of Allah. And to dare criticize them, it is as if you are criticizing Allah and His Messenger. Right? And this type of perverse mentality, honestly, it is the essence of Kharijism. It is the essence of what Kharijites view themselves. We are the true people, everybody else is kafir munafiq. And unfortunately, the issue of basically the story of Hatim and whatnot is used uh, in this regard. In any case, uh, we also need to point out that by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam, of all the scholars of Islam, a person who commits an act of kufr doesn't necessarily become a kafir. A person who commits an act of kufr does not necessarily become a kafir. You might have extenuating circumstances. You might have something called ta'wil. Ta'wil means you have some perverted logic. And Hatib's story is the best example of this. Hatib had ta'wil. And ta'wil means perverted logic. Perverted logic here is what? Hatib felt, Allah is going to protect you, Ya Rasulullah. I just want to protect my family. This is not kufr. It's wrong, but it's not kufr. And his ta'wil was valid to excuse kufr from him. You see my point here, right? Or another extenuating circumstance would be complete ignorance. Somebody can be jahil and Allah will excuse complete ignorance. So there is an example of the man, the Prophet ﷺ said, the man who was a sinner his whole life. Then when he died, what did he tell his children? Burn my body into ashes and distribute the ashes because I don't want Allah to resurrect me. So he felt by doing this, he could outwit Allah. So Allah gathered the ashes, said, Kun fayakun. The man is in front of him. Allah says, why did you do this? And the man said, I was scared of you, O Allah. So Allah forgave him because of that fear, even though what he did is an act of kufr, because what, is, what did he do? He thought he could outsmart Allah, right? But you cannot outsmart Allah. Why did Allah forgive him? Ignorance, ignorance. Or you could be forgiven because of, because of, what else? Being forced. The story of Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir, what happened with Ammar ibn Yasir? The Prophet ﷺ asked him when he was forced to bow down to the idol, to praise the idol, how was your heart? And he said, Mutma'innun bil iman. My heart is still firm in the faith. So the Prophet ﷺ said, In adu fa'ud. If they return, you return as well. He did kufr, but he didn't become a kafir because he's forced, right? So the problem with these groups is that they honestly are overzealous fanatics when it comes to everybody is a kafir and they have tendencies of Kharijism in them. How they view other Muslims, how they're willing to kill other Muslims and that is why I felt very important to, because they use the story of Hatib over here, that they say and their, their evidence is that Umar assumed him to be a kafir because of what he had done. This is their evidence, right? Because what did Umar say? 
Umar said, allow me to execute this munafiq because he has kafara billahi wa rasuli. And they say the Prophet was silent, silence is his approval, and therefore he agreed the action was an action of kufr. Okay, so this is the evidence that this group uses. And in response we say, that is an interpretation, and it might be a valid interpretation, even though I personally lean towards Ibn Taymiyyah's, but I admit there is a legitimate difference of opinion, and I respect Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's position, and the position of uh, his school after him, I respect that, they have the right to hold that position. But we say, you cannot just copy and paste from a book, and then apply it to your group, and expect your group is Islam. And your group is representing Allah and His Messenger. This is the essence of fanaticism. And these groups have caused more tension and damage to the Ummah even than the invading forces have caused. And this is the reality that I personally uh, believe in. In any case, this is the story of uh, Hatib ibn Abi Balta. I wanted to move on, but we have already finished our time. Insha'Allah, we will continue with the story of the conquest of Mecca. Uh, Insha'Allah ta'ala, next uh, Wednesday. Are there any questions about the story of Hatib before we uh, conclude for today? Any questions about the story of Hatib ibn Abi Balta? Naam, Fadl Sheikh. So the brother says, how about using the Kuffar army to conquer a Muslim land's army? See, in my opinion, all of these questions at a theoretical level are easy to discuss. Then at a practical level, you get into so many other variables. At a theoretical level, we can say anyone who is willing to kill others that believe in the same faith that he does, by using people who do not believe in his faith. And he does it for deen, sorry, for dunya. He does it for mal, he does it for jah. There is no doubt that this is kufr in my humble opinion. This is tawalli, that you are preferring a person's, uh, how, how do I phrase this? You are willing to sacrifice la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and turning to those who have rejected this in order to fight somebody uh, for a religious, or sorry, for a worldly reason. But the problem comes, there is no real life scenario that is that simple. In the real world, you have a million other factors, and I do not want to go into specifics. But I challenge you to think of, look at what's happening now. One Muslim country is helping another Kafir country to, against another Muslim country. And then the other Muslim country is opposed, and the other Muslim country is there. Each one of them has maslaha siyasiyya. Each one of them has political reasons. None of these players, by and large, really care about the religion when they do these things. None of them is doing it for the sake of the religion. Had they been fighting a Muslim for the sake of religion, there is no question in my mind, this is kufr akbar mukhrij min al-millah. No question. You're going to turn to adu Allah, to fight against wali Allah, because this person is a believer, and because the other is a, non, uh, 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 a non-Muslim, this is no doubt that you have loved uh, this is Tawalli, this is the essence of Tawalli. But if you look at Hatib's story, Hatib did not love Kufr and hate Islam. Hatib loved his mother and wanted to protect her. Tayyib, the Hakim, loves his Kursi. He's not doing it because he hates Allah and His Messenger. Not that I'm saying they're all Muslim or they're not Muslim, the Hakim has other problems. Aslan, they're not ruling by the Sharia, which is a bigger problem than this whole issue. But my point is, in the real world, there is no cut and dry scenario. And that is why I find it problematic to discuss such matters purely at a theoretical level. And I think one of our biggest problems is that these jihadist groups are all juhal. They don't have ulama amongst them. We know this. They don't have ulama amongst them. They read a book and they assume the book applies to them. And the job of the faqih is not to read a book. The job of the faqih is to apply the knowledge to the real situation. The faqih is not Google that you cut and paste. The faqih is a person who thinks, correct? The faqih is the, the one who extracts the ruling. And the problem is when you speak in theoretical levels, the jihadist groups hears the theory and then thinks it is cut and paste for his reality. You see the point, point here, right? So, in my humble opinion, Akhi, we leave theory as theory and we don't 
extract it into reality without going to a faqih and a sheikh and an alim and then uh, you know uh, mentioning exactly the scenario and situation and then getting the fatwa from him okay let me just say as I said fighting Islam for Islam is kufr akbar this is unanimous but fighting a Muslim for a dunyawi reason is not kufr akbar necessarily is that clear this is kufr asghar this is kabira min al kabair as our Prophet said, that qital al muslim muslim kufr, fusuq qitaluhu kufr, everybody knows kufr asghar here. You fight a Muslim for money, this is kufr asghar. You fight a Muslim for kursi, for siyasa, this is kufr asghar. But you fight a Muslim because he's a Muslim, this is kufr akbar. Okay? Yes, Fadl Shaykh, this is really going to raise a lot of issues, I know, but yes. Welcome back from your long journey. And you now come at the most interesting time when we need to hear your voice. Fadl. Uh, fighting for fighting a Muslim for Islam. So we have to groups and then we have the group that is that does not think that. We of course, this is totally theoretical and has nothing to do with the country you're from or the current situation of what is happening or even yesterday's news. Of course, completely theoretical, abstract country. Suppose there was an Islamic party that came to power. Suppose the army came and took them away. Suppose yes, okay. Suppose go ahead. <laughs> what's concerning me is that some people. What's concerning me is that <laughs> 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 the theory will not remain theory. Think this is an excuse that some part of the Islamists that they are being oppressed because of their sort of Islamism, their desire to politically import Islam or the Sharia, and I'm seeing this as a case of the second rule that you gave that, um, I, I don't know, maybe I'm probably wrong, but um, you said that fighting a Muslim for the, for the sake of being Muslim is kufr akbar, and then fighting a Muslim for the sake of um, something worldly, this is like kufr asghar, or it, it's not, you know, it's not totally going out of it. Um, so if you can elaborate on this issue, especially this Islamism issue, because people think that if I'm an Islamist, then I'm a sort of a higher rank Muslim than the typical people that do not believe that we have to employ Islam in an institutionalized way. But again, here's the point now, you are get, you're asking a question that is so loaded with modern issues, you cannot avoid answering without being realistic about the situation and scenario. and. Wallahi, the situation is too complex for a simple two-minute fatwa. And very bluntly, this situation is far bigger than me to comment on it. Wallahi, this is a situation that your own scholars of your land and the scholars of the Middle East themselves are embroiled and engulfed in. And this is a time of fitna. You have people of knowledge differing in their analysis. And we don't doubt the iman of anybody who has demonstrated that he has Iman, right? We don't doubt the, the, the Islam of the one who shows his Islam outwardly. At the same time, Wallahi, I don't know what to tell you. All that I can say is this is a time of fitna and fawda. This is a time of great chaos. And it is always better to err on the side of caution when it comes to takfir. This is the general rule, ya ikhwa. My dear brothers and sisters, keep your mouths quiet if you, ha if you can, rather than say, so and so is a kafir. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Man qala li akhihi kafir, ya kafir, faqad ba'a bihi ahaduhuma. Whoever Muslim calls another Muslim a kafir, the label will apply to the one of the two. If it will not apply to him, it will come back to you. And I think one of the biggest problems we have is we're so obsessed. Is this group kafir or not? Is this group Muslim or not? Is this group... And this is, you know, whether they're, you know, yani Islamist or Ikhwani or Sufi or Ash'ari or Sufi or Tabliqi or Salafi or, uh, or Shi'i. Subhanallah. Just let's move above all of these labels and judge people. Firstly, only those who are qualified to judge should judge. I mean, why judge? Secondly, yes, secondly, only those who have a reason to judge should judge. There are some people who need to judge.
There are some people who are ulama which say they need to judge. For the most of us, the average person amongst us, the general rule is very simple. Take the hadith of the Prophet in Sahih al-Bukhari. Man salla salatana wa staqbala qiblatana wa akala dhabihatana fadhalikum al-Muslim lahu dhimmatullahi wa dhimmatu rasulihi. Whoever prays the salah and faces the qibla and slaughters according to our rituals, that is the Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, that وَلَا تَقُولُ لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامَ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنًا Don't say to the one who says salam to you, you're not a Muslim. So somebody says salam, assalamu alaykum, and you see them in the masjid, and you see them praying, and you see them doing the sha'air of Islam, they are a Muslim unless and until something happens that expels them from Islam, which is just as certain as the certainty that put them into Islam. I.e. you saw them worshipping an idol for example out of willingness to worship the idol. Otherwise, the safer rule, the average Muslim deals with anybody who claims to be a Muslim as a Muslim. And Allah will not punish you if you say, Oh Allah, I didn't know he was a kafir, I'd rather on the side of caution. And you were quiet. And Allah might punish you if you call other people kafir when they're not kafir. So to err on the side of caution is better. This fitna, no doubt, you know where my sympathies lies. I've been very explicit in them in the khutbahs and in the durus. No doubt, you know where my sympathies lie. Yet, we also know for a fact that there are people on the other side who have a love of Allah and His Messenger, who are praying, who are reading the Qur'an. Yet, for some reason, some ta'wil, they feel such an animosity to this group not because of the religion, but because of whatever politics or whatever the perception they have. And this is something you know and I know. Correct? So let's not bring in kufr and iman into this equation. And actually the khutbah I gave about Egypt, I was very clear about this. That both sides have their ta'wil as long as the people involved are practicing Muslims. We're not talking about the secularist camp Aslan. We're not talking about those who don't want Aslan, uh, Islam. That's, they have self-proclaimed themselves what they are. We're talking about the people that are praying and practicing on both sides. They have ta'wil and wallahi if Ali and Muawi radiallahu anhuma, it was better for us to be quiet about the two of them. How about people after them? Right? Neither side is going to reach the level of either Ali and Muawiyah. Correct? So, they have good on this side and they have some good on the other side. No doubt, one of the two is closer to the truth. Yet, even the one that is closer to the truth is not fully innocent. Each side has its problem. So, Wallahi, ya ikhwa, let's just keep takfir out of it. My whole point in going into this tangent was to demonstrate, well, many things of them is how modern political theory is based upon the seerah directly and how modern events are shaped by the seerah. And of them as well as to show, look, there's not just one opinion of the story of Hatib. You have the position of, yes, it is true, uh, some scholars had this position, but you have Ibn Taymiyyah's position as well. And Ibn Taymiyyah's position, in my opinion, is more precise than the position of the later school. So I wanted to also demonstrate the diversity in that. Anyway, we have gone way beyond the time. and there is